Good evening and welcome to another edition of Larry King Let's Talk every Saturday night at 7 here on Channel 7. Tonight an extraordinary lady, I think even her foremost critics would admit that. It's rare in American uh, politics or American circles that one person, one individual, can change a whole concept. Phyllis Schlafly did that. We'll meet her on Larry King Let's Talk coming up. My special guest tonight is Phyllis Schlafly. I guess if we had a point to one thing, Phyllis Schlafly changed America by changing the vote on ERA. It was as simple as that. Do you feel uh, like a Donna Quixote? Well, every movement has to have a leader. We had uh, millions of people on our side, and all I did was bring it all together. But it all focused on you. By that I mean no political leadership was behind you. Gerald Ford was in favor of the ERA. Richard Nixon was in favor of ERA. George Bush was in favor of Jimmy the, uh, Carter. Don't Jimmy forget Carter, him. the president at the time. I mean, well, it is you true. Uh, had a lot of windmills. We showed that individual American citizens who do not hold public office and who don't have a big bankroll behind them or own a newspaper uh, can affect public policy. And I think that's very exciting. I think that's part of the self-government uh, process that our founding fathers gave us in this free country. I believe left, right, center, that an individual spurring on a movement can change things. Yes, I think it's a tremendous lesson. And this, this is why I don't understand these people who throw up their hands at the political process in this country. It is complicated, uh, but it's available there, and it is freedom, and it sure is better than whatever any other country has. Why did you decide to take it on, since I guess no rational person would be against people being treated equally? Well, the first uh, the reason that motivated me was my realization that it would require young women to be drafted and put in military combat. That was the first thing? Yes, that was first. And that's what an absolute sex-neutral uh, constitutional rule would do. Uh, but as the years went on, we found that there were many other reasons, like more power to the federal courts, which most people don't want to do. And then as the years went along, uh, we found that it did have an abortion connection. And uh, this is now clear in the briefs filed by the American Civil Liberties Union that they want to use ERA to mandate tax-funded abortions. So that became an additional argument. And then you have the whole uh, gay rights arguments. And then you have the argument about uh, the effect it would have in wiping out veterans' preference, which is admitted by some of the advocates. And um, more recently, you have an argument about uh, losing the tax exemption of private and religious schools. Uh, on, the other, on the other side, uh, if I had to say the real reason why the ERA is lost is that they don't have a product to sell. Uh, th there's nothing good that they can point to. How about the side that says, though, they lost but they won? We, in effect, have ERA in America. Okay, they're not drafted. But women are equal in America today. Of course every, they're equal. Every employment place is conscious of hiring women. There are strides toward equal pay for equal work. Et cetera. Well, so in a well, sense, we're all for that. And uh, one of our main arguments was that ERA would do nothing to help that. Uh, we already have those federal laws. And uh, that is uh, not what ERA would do since that is already done by federal law. Or take me inside. How did you do it? How? how? Yeah, how did you do it? I mean, what had they, they had won how many states when you started this fight? Uh, they had won about 30 states, and they only had to get 38. Okay, so how Well, I understand politics. Politics is a fascinating subject, and I know how the legislative and political process operates. And uh, so I knew what the arguments were. I knew how to go to the legislatures and uh, present uh, our case, and uh, we knew how to make the process operate. But you needed legwork because you couldn't work federally. This was a state-by-state state issue, That's right? Correct. The federal government was out of it. That's correct. I went around and testified at about 30 of the states, and uh, that mobilized our movement, and we made it very clear that women were against this notion of mandating absolute uh, sex-neutral treatment in everything. Why did it get uh, so bitter? And it got bitter on both sides. Well, it, you, it, would deny, you wouldn't deny it got bitter on this. Bitter, yes, because it touches a lot of emotional issues that fe people feel very deeply about. Uh, you know, it's, it's funny. When my, uh, when my youngest daughter became 18 
And I realized that what these people really wanted was to take my five, five foot two little girl and treat her just like a man and draft her and put her in basic training and teach her to kill and send her out into our country's wars just like the men. Yes, I do get emotional about that. Right, on that issue. You see, they never denied it. Yeah, but once you're in service, there is no democracy. The head of That's a base. Right. No, but the head of a base can choose to send women to conflict or not send them into conflict. Well, that's why we don't want our daughters drafted. But most nations do draft oh, women, no, don't no. they? Oh, Israel no. drafts women. Oh, no, but they don't. Israel doesn't have an ERA. Uh, Israel treats women very differently. Yeah, but I mean, there is no democracy in service. By that, I mean, I have freedom of movement in the United States, but if in the army, they can send me to Colorado tomorrow. That's so right. Therefore, they can hold women out of conflict tomorrow. They don't have to put women into conflict because it's not a democracy. That's correct. So but why we would the ERA be covered? Be, in service. Because we have federal laws today that exempt women from combat duty. And those laws are obviously um, sex discriminatory. So they would become unconstitutional under ERA. And uh, no commander could send a platoon of all males because that's obvious that he had discriminated. Any more than he could send a platoon to charge on the hill that were all whites or all blacks. So you're judged by the effect. You think a commander would send women in? I do believe the army will obey the Constitution. And, and, and all the advocates admitted this. All right, well, a woman who wanted to fight, what's wrong with that? What if a woman wanted to fight and was capable of fighting? <laughs> They're not going to get my daughter. See, that's what it boiled down to, and that's the reason why we won. The American people are not going to put up with treating women just like men when it comes to the armed forces. Where, but that's only one of the, one of the issues. And, you know, when it, when it was... it was the first one for you. Right. And it is very uh, meaningful to me, and it was a great motivator. But when it came back, in uh, after uh, you know the last time I saw you was when we celebrated the end of the uh, ten-year fight and then Tip O'Neill brought it back in in 1983 SJ Res 1 and the reason it failed in uh, Congress is by that time it was evident to everybody that the advocates of the Equal Rights Amendment wanted to use it to uh, overturn the Hyde Amendment and to force federal tax funds to be spent for abortions. And there's a clear majority in this country and in Congress uh, in favor of the Hyde Amendment against tax-funded abortions. And uh, so uh, the ERA types refused to uh, change the language by so much as one comma, and um, if they wouldn't uh, compromise on it, they're not going to get it. Uh, the polls show America favors it, though. Don't they, don't oh, it? look, I've run polls, and I've studied polls, and you can get any answer you want, depending on the way you construct the question. If you construct the question, do you want a constitutional rule that will require 18-year-old uh, girls to be registered and drafted just like men and sent into combat, you know what the answer would be. Uh, you said that they refused to change it. How would you write it? Well, what I would think be the it's, Phyllis Schlafly amendment to the Constitution, or you don't think we need any? Well, I don't think we need it. I proposed nine separate amendments when I testified before the House Judiciary Committee. But the uh, position of the advocates is they will not have a single one, uh, not a single amendment. They won't change it by a comma. And so, uh, as a result of that, I will tell you that ERA is dead. It, Absolutely. It is if Tip O'Neill, last year, with all his power, and with a good majority in the House, was not able to put it through, uh, I don't see any possibility that uh, it's going to go anywhere in the next Congress. Where stands, in your opinion today, the equality of women in this country? Oh, I think... How uh, far along is the battle? I mean, obviously they had a battle. Yeah, well, it all depends on, on what your goal is. Now, if you want equal um, education and employment opportunity, I think women have, they, I think women have it. I think they can go into any career that they want. They can have any type of education. Um, I think uh, that the, the laws are all in place and uh, women have a great cafeteria array of uh, careers they can select. I don't see any impediments except in the minds of the women who wake up in the morning thinking that the world is against them. You're saying a woman today if she went to work as a director in this television station, she'd be paid the same as the male director. Absolutely. She'd get her increases the same as other people, Absolutely. promotions the same as other people. Right. When are we going to see more women as uh, general managers, chief executive officers, heads of companies? When? When women put into a single career the number of hours a week and years of their life that men do. 
And in the world we live in, the typical average married woman has only spent one-third of her potential working years in the paid labor force. Now, if you are a man or a woman and, and you only spend a third of your lifetime in the paid labor force, building up a single career, you are not going to be the general manager. But if you start at 19, 20 years from now, you should have a shot at it, right? Yes, you should. And will you? You do have a shot right, right now. But in, in the world that we live in today, a great majority of women like to spend time bringing up their children. Now, we can uh, speculate that maybe in the next 30 years it won't be that way, and um, I don't know. Uh, How do you react when they said it wasn't that way for you? It was that, that you way. you were an activist. Um, I, I had every opportunity. I, I spent 20 years raising six children. I have not been in the paid labor force. I, I now um, am a lawyer, but there's no way that I could ever earn what my husband earns, who spent all his life in the law, uh, I've only spent a few years in it. I spent 20 years raising six children. Now, the employer in the workplace is not obligated to compensate me for the years that I spent bringing up my children. That isn't right at all. Did you ever think, Phyllis, maybe humorously, that you ought to thank ERA in a sense? I mean, it really made you famous. It, it's true it made me famous, it if did. that were the goal. But it didn't do anything for me in terms of the goals that I'd set in my life or happiness or fulfillment, it, it's perfectly obvious that fame doesn't always bring happiness. I had happiness and fulfillment before ERA came into my life, and uh, it's true I put a lot into that. Um, fame wasn't exactly my, my goal, so with fame comes certain good, certain bad. Things you don't like about fame? Well, yes, sure. There, I mean, there, when you go into a controversial area like politics, there's a good side and there's a bad side. And a lot of people can't take the controversy of it, but... Um, you like it. Uh, I have learned to like the controversy. Uh, my husband taught me that if, if you can't stand controversy, it's, you're, you're like a doctor who can't stand the sight of blood. You're simply in the wrong business. We'll be right back with Phyllis Schlafly. We'll discuss some other things after these messages. Our guest is Phyllis Schlafly, who heads an organization called the Eagle Forum. I know after they discovered the cure for, uh, for polio, the Jonas Salk and the folks at the March of Dimes decided to get into numerous birth problems because they had a psychological problem after defeating it to stir their workers up. What are you out after now? Oh, we have a whole range of activities. I would say all of our members are very active in electing candidates to office from the top to the bottom this conservative year. Conservative candidates. Yes, conservative and pro-family candidates. So we're active all up and down the line on that. We've also been active in a lot of issues. Um, for example, I was a member of the Republican Platform Committee, and we had a number of other Eagles who were uh, because they're active in politics. And um, we think we produced a great platform that uh, proposes the way for economic growth and, uh, and a future with a strong and growing economy. For example, one of the things that we've been working on is raising the tax exemption for children and giving the homemaker her fair rights in the individual retirement accounts. Uh, there are so many injustices built into the tables of the tax code. And I'm very happy that the platform adopted this and the Reagan administration has adopted our, our proposals. We, th we think that the tax exemption for children should be raised immediately to $2,000 a year. And actually, it, it should go up to 5000 if children were to have the same value in the tax code today that they did 30 years ago. And on the homemaker, we think that she's a person and is entitled to have the same benefits as any working man or woman. So we favor raising the, uh, the amount that she can put in IRAs to the same amount that any working man or woman can put in. Were you hurt that some people close to the president said that uh, he did not agree with all that platform, but platforms are forgotten in November? I believe that was a White House quote. Well, that's all right. You never agree with anything 100%. And when you have a committee of 100 people working on it, it didn't bother it's... Uh, you. Well, no, no, that doesn't bother me at all. all right. but, but the major features of economic growth, of, of looking to a world in which uh, we, um, we cut taxes, we are more fair to the traditional family, 
Uh, those uh, uh, principles have been adopted by the Reagan administration, and we think they're very significant. As a woman, politics aside, if that's possible, mm. were you at least uh, proud that a woman is running for vice president of the United States, that people can now say to their daughters, you can grow up to be president someday? You're talking about Geraldine Ferraro. It's the only other one and I know. Well, um, no, because she's an affirmative action choice. And what I think, mean? well, I mean, she was chosen because she was a woman. And then you opposed uh, and I think Justice O'Connor, too. I think a woman should be president when she does the same thing that a man does to be president, which is to go into the primaries and offer herself to the voters from New Hampshire to California. Now, that's the route. And then you know whether the voters like her or not. You mean whether you president or vice president should go through the primary system? I think yes. Mm -hmm. All right, but that's not been the history. Well, it sure is what Reagan and Bush did. Uh, but Reagan in '60 chose Schweiker. In 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 '76, Schweiker didn't go through the primary system. Ford chose. Yes, and and I think Dole, most people will say that that both those choices were mistakes. Weren't you at least proud that a woman is running? You're a woman. Aren't you proud? I'm Jewish. If a Jew were running for president, whether I support him or not, I'd at least say, gee, it's. I'm proud. You know, Jude never ran for president. I've I know Catholics that voted against Kennedy were, were still proud that a Catholic was the standard bearer. Okay, granted all that, uh, I think your question is predicated on women being a voting block like... No, on a woman just being proud of another woman running for the highest office in the land. Just the fact that a woman is running for the second highest office. No, women don't react that way. I think uh, women are, cannot be pandered to as a group. They don't, they don't react the same way. They don't vote for somebody because she's a woman. Now, I'm very happy that Jean Kirkpatrick is uh, telling those uh, uh, communists and third worlders off in the UN she's doing a super job. And um, I admire that. I think that's super. Um, but I admire what she's doing, not because she's a woman. And, and uh, I like that. But um, I think the fact that Geraldine Ferraro was an affirmative action choice means that a lot of the uh, 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 facts about her that are plaguing her today did not come out till after she was chosen. You, did you then oppose Justice O'Connor, who came from an appellate court in Arizona and was an obvious affirmative action choice for the Supreme Court? Well, yes, she was that. Of course, that is the history of the way court justices are chosen. Most of them are chosen for political reasons. And so are most vice presidents. Um, Political reasons, yes. So but, Ferraro was chosen politically. Aren't you still proud? But, but the p political reason for which she was chosen was not a valid reason. The political reason for which she was chosen was all this gender gap garbage about uh, women not loving Reagan and that if he put a woman on, women would support the ticket. And their own polls are now showing that the gap is even greater and that, the, that, that Ferraro is a drag on the ticket instead of a plus to the ticket. Is there a woman you would have liked to have seen nominated? Yeah, but they were all in the other party, and they didn't want to change. Do you agree with President Ford that we're going to see women probably nominated on both tickets in four years? I think it all depends if they go into the primaries and the voters like them. Look, a year ago, all the smart people thought that John Glenn was a real natural for the Democratic ticket. They might be better off today if they had chosen John Glenn. But the voters nixed it, and they have a right to make that decision for the reasons of their choice. Maybe it was because he didn't have enough hair. I don't know why. <laughs> but the voters can make that choice. And to, to put somebody on as an affirmative action choice, um, I think, is proving to be a mistake. Based on uh, performance of a couple weeks ago, are you concerned about tomorrow night's debate? No, no. I think Reagan is just great, and I think he's going to win. And you didn't think he was great two weeks ago. Well, I like everything he said. Uh, it well, is even Laxalt said he was, that even the chairman of the party said that that was a bad performance. It wasn't his best performance. That's perfectly true. On the other, other hand, uh, I liked what he said. Now, Mondale spoke very vigorously, confidently, and forcefully about raising taxes. But I do not think that the, the dramatics or the histrionics or the confidence or the skill of saying I'm going to raise taxes is going to get votes. Now, maybe, maybe Reagan didn't uh, uh, have uh, as much uh, um, acting skill as Mondale in saying it's that he was, to hear that, he was going, not going to raise taxes, but he's got the right side of that issue. Are, are you more confident tomorrow night because it's foreign affairs, necessarily? I don't know. I'll be watching. Politics are fun. Do you think Reagan could lose? Lose the election? 
Well, anything can happen. You always run scared. But I, I am pretty confident that uh, Ronald Reagan's going to win. And the reason he's going to win is because of what he's done to the economy. When he went into office, the biggest, the biggest problem was inflation. He licked inflation. But he was going to balance the budget in two years, and he has the largest deficit in history. Th that's right. But he has uh, licked inflation. He has brought down the interest rates, and he has uh, had the most fantastic record of job creation in the private sector in the history of the world. That is more than six million new jobs created in the last two years. We'll have our remaining moments with Phyllis Schlafly right after this. Are you a, a slightly annoyed, Phyllis, that your real expertise before all of this ERA thing, where I knew Phyllis Schlafly from reading you and hearing you on CBS radio, was foreign affairs and weaponry? That's your expertise, weaponry, right? Right. Well, I served on the National Security Subcommittee on the Republican Platform Committee, and we have a great plank. Uh, we are uh, wholly supporting Ronald Reagan's uh, strategic space-based defense initiatives. And but I, I meant, aren't you annoyed that most Americans see you as ERA when your expertise... That's in the control I mean, you know from the... missile heads and warheads and right. MIRVs, you know all that. Right. It doesn't bother you that, that the public doesn't perceive you that way. Uh, that's the decision of the media who run things on how they have pictured me to the audience, and that's something over which I have no control. I have sold millions of copies of my books, but the media have chosen to paint me a particular way, uh, just as they are now trying to paint uh, Ronald Reagan as though he's uh, a loser uh, in the debates. And they're trying to tell us that uh, all the women are going to vote for Ferraro. Now, I don't think those things are true, but there they are. They are media decisions. Thank you, Phyllis. Thank you. Phyllis Schlafly, stay tuned for Ebert and Siskel. This is Larry King. We're here with Let's Talk every Saturday night at 7.